Amen. Church, I want you to go back to our, our psalm that we read, Psalm 68. I found it to be uh, fitting in the providence of God that we read Psalm 68. And uh, undoubtedly, I think when we read the Psalms, and really just anything in the Old Testament, it, it, it is so easy just to read through and read past some, some really glorious truths and, and some glory, glorious realities in the Scriptures. And I want to read an Old Testament text, a New Testament text, and I want to walk through one aspect of importance in the ascension of Christ. In a sermon that, or uh, exhortation, I don't know, a sermon, I'm not sure what you call these, uh, that I've titled, Christ's Victorious March. Psalm 68, I want to read verses 7 to 18, and then we're going to go over to the New Testament. I want to read this again for us. Verse 7, O God, when You went out before Your people, when You marched through the wilderness, the earth quaked. The heavens poured down rain before God, the One of Sinai, before God, the God of Israel. Rain in abundance, O God, You shed abroad. You restored Your inheritance as it languished. Your flock found a dwelling in it. Your goodness, O God, You provided for the needy. The Lord gives the Word. The women who announce the news are a great host. The kings of the armies, they flee, they flee. The women at home divide the spoil. Though you men lie among the sheepfolds, the wings of a dove covered with silver, its pinions with shimmering gold. When the Almighty scatters kings there, let snow fall on Zalman. O mountain of God, mountain of Bashan, O many-peaked mountain, mountain of Bashan, why do you look with hatred, O many-peaked mountain, at the mount that God desired for His abode? Yes, where the Lord will dwell forever. The chariots of God are twice ten thousand, thousands upon thousands. The Lord is among them. Sinai is now in the sanctuary. You ascended on high, leading a host of captives in your train and receiving gifts among men, even among the rebellious, the Lord God may dwell there. Let's go over to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. And let's read starting in verse 7. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when He ascended on high, He led a host of captives and He gave gifts to men. And saying He ascended, what does it mean? But that He also descended into the lower regions of the earth. He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens, that He might fill all things. And He gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into Him who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped when each part is working properly, it makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Amen. Brother, my desire today is that you would be encouraged in recognizing that you have a conquering king who gives gifts to his people for the purpose that the church, his bride, would be built up, that his kingdom would be advanced, and that we would dwell together in unity. Brethren, I want you to see, Paul quotes here in a passage about Christ giving gifts to men. He quotes Psalm 68. 
He quotes Psalm 68 in verse 8 there in chapter 4. When he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. What Paul is telling us here is that Psalm 68 is about Christ. It is about the ascension of Christ. It is about, it is about Christ marching on in victory, conquering kingdoms, conquering nations, being enthroned, and then distributing the spoil among the people of God. Let me ask you a question. Do you think yourself insignificant in this church? Do you think yourself insignificant in the local church, in the global church, the church universal? If you are a blood-bought child of Christ, it is my hope today that you would be encouraged to see that you are not insignificant but that the conquering King has given you a gift and it is to be used for His glory. It is to be used for the building up of the church. It is to be used to serve one another that we may all attain unity and maturity in Christ, in His church. Now, what I want to do very quickly is I want to do a quick flyover of Psalm 68, verses 7 to 18. I want to lay it in the context. I want to show you uh, what it's about historically here. And then I want to show you how it points to Jesus Christ because we have a need to do that because Paul quotes verse 18 in Psalm 68 and applies it right to Christ. Now, this, this psalm is an enthronement psalm. And I think the historical context here is when King David is bringing in the ark of God into Jerusalem. Okay, He's bringing the, the, the ark into Jerusalem, its final resting place in 2 Samuel chapter 6. Now, I want you to see a few things here. I want you to see the movement of the psalm. And I'm going to go as slow and quickly as I can. We're not going to dive too much into this, but I want you to see how this points to Christ. I want you to see God's victorious march from Egypt and its culmination in Jerusalem, physical Zion, in verses 7 to 18. And then, I'm not going to go through this, but when God comes into the sanctuary, when the ark comes to Jerusalem on Mount Zion, you get in verses 19 to the end, which we're not going to talk about, but the blessings of His reign. So let's look first, before we get to verse 7, look at verse 1. Verse 1 says, God shall arise, His enemies shall be scattered, and those who hate Him shall flee before Him. Brethren, this is the war cry of Moses back in Numbers chapter 10, whenever the ark set out, which was the very presence, the very footstool of God, where God dwelt among the cherubim there in the ark, the ark would get up, the ark would lead out, God leading His people. Moses would say in, in, in Numbers 10, God arise, arise, lead your people. God marching through the wilderness, conquering and leading the people of God. And then when the ark stopped, He would say, Lord, return. This is Moses speaking that the ark would go out with the people of God. God going before the people to scatter the enemies, to protect them. The picture is God going forth to war. Brethren, do you see Christ as, as the Son of Man, the Son of God going forth to war? Do you see Him that way? the divine warrior and the divine protector of His people. And so you get here in verse 7, God marching out through the wilderness. O oh God, when You went out before Your people. This is, this is David recalling this. And You marched through the wilderness. The earth quaked. The heavens poured down rain before God, the One of Sinai. Before God, the God of Israel. See some of the pictures there. God marching out through the wilderness. The earth quaking as when God physically came down and, and dwelt upon Sinai, quaking, leading hundreds of thousands of His people through the wilderness. He's marching out after saving His people out of Egypt. Saving them from bondage. Leading them now to the promised land. 
And then you see in verses 11 to 14 that these kings are routed. These kings are scattered. These kings are defeated. The kings of the land are cast out. Look at what you see here. The Lord gives the word. The women who announce the news are a great host. The kings of the armies, they flee, they flee. The women at home divide the spoil. See the images here. Recall the images. Kings are fleeing. There's spoil being divided. The conquest of Canaan. And if you read your Old Testament, you know that Moses and the people of Israel conquer two kings. And then you read Joshua, which is the conquest of the promised land. And you read in Joshua chapter 12 that Joshua routed and destroyed 31 kings as the people of God, led by the man of God, were expelling the wicked people of the land. Why? Because God dwelt there. He does not and will not dwell with wickedness. God dispelling the wicked from His presence. And you also think of King David conquering the Philistines on this march, on this conquest. Now notice in in, in verse 11, who gives the word? The Lord gives the word. It is the Lord who makes the announcement of victory. Yahweh is the victorious general of His army and He gives the word. And look at who's celebrating this and, and publishing it. It's the women. The women are here. They are announcing. The kings of the armies, they flee. They flee. They're publishing the, the, the victory. You may recall... I want to show you a couple of these. Go go, go to Exodus 15. Exodus 15, 21. This is right after God crushes and defeats the Egyptians through the Red Sea. You have Moses... And he, he, he sings this song, and then right after that, we read in verse 19 of Exodus chapter 15, when the horses of Pharaoh and his chariots and his horsemen went into the sea, the Lord brought back the waters from the sea upon them. But the people of Israel walked on dry ground in the midst of the sea. Then Miriam, the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took tambourine in her hand, and all the women went out after her with tambourines and dancing. And Miriam sang this song, Sing to the Lord, for He has triumphed gloriously. The horse and its rider He has thrown into the sea. We have a picture here of women celebrating, publishing the news of the victory of Yahweh. Look it over in 1 Samuel chapter 18. First Samuel chapter 18. David has just slain that Philistine, Goliath. And he's coming back into the city after conquering God's enemy. Look at verse 6. And they were coming home when David returned from striking down the Philistine. The women came out of all the cities of Israel, singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tambourines, with songs of joy, with the musical instruments. And the women sang to one another as they celebrated. Saul has struck down his thousands and David his tens of thousands. Again, publishing the victory that Yahweh has conquered this David, this future king who we know is a type of Christ routing God's enemies. I want you to keep that in mind as we, as we move through here. So the, 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 the kings are routed. God is on the move through the wilderness. The kings are, 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 are fleeing. And then we see the ark of God ascending the hill of Zion to its resting place. You see that in verses 15 to 18. O mountain of God, mountain of Bashan, O many-peaked mountain, mountain of Bashan. Why do you look with hatred, O many-peaked mountain, at the mount that God desires for His abode? Zion was a puny little hill. 
And this many peak, majestic, glorious mountains, they look majestic in the eyes of man. And Zion looks like a puny hill, but God has chosen the insignificant place to dwell so that He would receive glory. Yes, where the Lord will dwell forever. Verse 17, the chariots of God are twice ten thousand. Thousands upon thousands. The Lord is among them. Sinai, the ESV reads, is now in the sanctuary. The NASB has here that He's in the sanctuary as He was at Sinai. The NIV reads that He came from Sinai to His sanctuary. So the picture is this. The, 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 Ark, the Ark of the Covenant, the very presence of God is, is coming into Jerusalem. It's coming. It's ascending the mountain of Zion to then dwell and rest. The conquest is over. It's done. It's complete. Then God rests. And we see here in verse 18, David says, You ascended on high. He's describing this for us. Leading a host of captives in your train. He's conquered. He's receiving gifts among men, even among the rebellious, that the Lord God may dwell there. And from His sanctuary, brethren, that God, as it were, is now seated and He is disposing and dispensing the blessings upon His people. I want to look at two of these in verses 19-31 to 31, just quickly. Look at God's all-sufficient all care in verse 19. Blessed be the Lord who daily bears us up. God is our salvation. Brethren, God's blessing on the people is that He bears our burdens. He blesses us, brethren. It is God who comes and daily bears us up. He sufficiently cares for us. And then also we see in verse 35 of that same psalm, we have God giving again. There it is in 35. Awesome is God from His sanctuary, the God of Israel. He is the one who gives power and strength to His people. Blessed be God. The conquering King marches on, ascends the physical hill of Zion, and dwells there and rests and dispenses gifts to His people. And we see David doing this. Go, go, to, go to 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 18. Second Samuel chapter six. This is this is a whole account of the ark being brought into Jerusalem. And then look at chapter eighteen. And when David had finished offering the burnt offerings and the peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts, and distributed among all the people, the whole multitude of Israel, both men and women, a cake of bread, a portion of meat and a cake of raisins to each of them. Then, they all, then all the people departed, each to his house. We have the king giving gifts to his people in celebration of the victory, in celebration of the conquest. The king has conquered. Now, with all of this laid out in real summary, sweep over fashion here, brethren, this conquest... Its fulfillment is found in Christ. Its fulfillment is found in Christ. It is Christ who rescues us from slavery as Yahweh rescued His people from Egypt. It is Christ who comes and He conquers kings and He triumphs over evil on the cross. What do we read in Colossians 2.15? That Christ made a public spectacle of the forces of darkness by triumphing over them in the cross. Put them to, to, to open shame. He routes God's enemies through His work on the cross. What do we read in Matthew chapter 12? That the Son of God comes, Jesus, and He binds the strong man, casting out demons, plundering the goods of Satan, plundering His house, brethren, saving God's people out of the hand of the enemy. He takes the spoil 
We read in John chapter 12, verse 31, when Jesus says, Now is the judgment of this world. Now is the ruler of this world cast out. And I, when I am lifted up, will draw all peoples to Myself. This is undoubtedly talking about His crucifixion and His resurrection or, or, or His ascension. Brother, when the King is ascended on high, sitting at the right hand of the Father, what do we see happening? Him drawing all peoples to Himself. And what do we see here in Psalm 68 when, when God ascends Mount Zion and He is seated and He ascends on high. Look at, look at if you're still there in, verse, in uh, chapter 68 of, of, of the psalm. What do we see? The nations coming in, in verses 28 to 31. You see there in verse 31, nobles shall come from Egypt. Cush, Ethiopia, shall hasten to stretch out her hands to God. The nations are pouring in because Christ is ascended on high. But brethren, listen. Christ is the victorious general who gives the announcement of the victory. And after the resurrection, what do we see happening? Go over to, to, to Luke 24. Christ is the victorious general announcing the victory. Luke 24. The first day of the week at early dawn, they went to the tomb. Who's they? We're going to see here. Taking the spices they prepared and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And while they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by in dazzling apparel. And they, and they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground. And the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but he's risen. Remember how He told you while He was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified on the third day. And, rem and they remembered His words. And returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James and the other women with them who told them these things to the apostles. Brethren, what do we see here? We have women again publishing the victory. Christ has risen from the dead. The King has conquered. The women are being sent out and publishing it. We have it here again. Here are the women. You, you see it over again in, in Matthew chapter 28, verses 1-8. to And you have Christ announcing His victory to His people. You ever thought about that in the Great Commission? Jesus says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Brethren, that is, that is an announcement of victory. It's done. All authority has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always till the end of the age. We have Christ as the victorious general announcing the news of the conquest, the victory. It is done. And brethren, Christ ascends not physical Zion. He ascends to the heavenly Zion to reign over the nations. And we read that in, chap in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 18, that, that, that we, the church, have not come to physical Sinai, but we've come to the heavenly Jerusalem. And we follow in the train of Christ. We follow after the King, marching up, because He has purchased us with His own blood. And He leads His people, brethren. He leads us. And what do we see as Paul says, Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father and He is giving gifts to men and women His people. Ephesians chapter 4. You could turn there with me. Christ, the conquering King, has risen. He has ascended. 
And as a good king does, as a glorious king does, Christ, He gives gifts to men. But brethren, it's not just cakes of raisins, and it's not meat, and it's not a loaf of bread. Brethren, it's much greater. It's not silver or gold. Brethren, He gives gifts to the church. He, first, He gives men who speak the Word of God to the bride. So we see there the apostles and, and the evangelists and the prophets and the shepherd teachers, the pastors, to equip the, the, the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. But brethren, He doesn't just give men to the church to speak the Word of God. He gives gifts to all of His people. To you. If you're a Christian, God has given you a spiritual gift. We've talked about this. Christ has taken the spoil and He bestows gifts upon all His saints. There is no one insignificant in the church of God. If you are a born-again, bud-blot saint, Christ has given you a gift because He has ascended. And that gift is for the purpose of, of building up the body of Christ. To minister it to one another, as Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 4. As anyone has received a gift, use it. Brethren, you are not insignificant. Christ has conquered and He's given you the spoil. And that is to bring the unity of the church. Listen, your church membership is utterly, utterly glorious. Don't think it a light thing, brethren. Don't think it a light thing. I want you to see that in the ascension of Christ. It's not, a, it, it's, not a, it's not a little matter. It's not a little matter. Christ has equipped you. He has plundered the enemy. Your role is important in the church. Christ has conquered. He takes the spoil. Disperses it to His people to build His kingdom. Not to just satisfy us physically, but to build, to labor. And you and I, church, we enter into the conquest of the Son of God. We follow in His train. Expanding the kingdom. Filled with the Spirit of God as our brother just preached. Christ gave the Spirit. He empowered the church for its mission, brethren. If Christ does not go away, we don't have the Spirit of God. We are not carrying out what we're not carrying out the mission of God. We're not doing it. He's given us the Spirit. He's given individual members of the church gifts for the building up of the church to build, to labor, brethren. To do battle. To love one another. To serve one another. Until we all attain and grow up in every way into Christ, attaining the unity and the fullness of the stature of Christ. Brethren, the ascension of Christ is important for you. Your King has conquered. And your King has given you good gifts. Use it. Use it for His glory that all would know the Son of God. Let's pray.